effort to uh, make a computer that can translate is as old as computing. Um, the whole AI concept started in like 1956. And the whole idea of the automaton has been around for uh, centuries. It goes back thousands of years. And Google Translate is, is just the latest iteration of that. Welcome back to the Inside Japan podcast, sponsored by jobsinjapan.com, the best place on the internet to find your next job in Japan. I'm Charlie, and on this episode, we're going to be talking with Paul Flint, the owner of Honyaku Plus, a translation company. We go into how to get your start in translation work, whether machine translations are actually a threat to future jobs, and the different skills you'll require to be an interpreter versus a translator, among many other things. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Let's jump straight into it. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for coming on the Inside Japan podcast. Well, thank you for having me. All right. So um, tell me about your start in Japan and how you came to be running a translation company. Okay. Um, so I uh, always wanted to go to Japan. I uh, started studying Japanese back in uh, San Francisco um, for that day when I would once go move in to Japan. I came here first in 85, uh, uh, playing in the band. Mm. And, oh, wow. Uh, uh, and and I loved it, you know. From the time I got off of the, of the airplane, I thought, "This is cool." And uh, and ninety uh, two, I moved here, and uh, you know, didn't really know what I was going to be doing. But uh, I, um, I I taught English for a little bit, um, all private lessons. Didn't get into a you know, didn't go to work for a school or anything like that. Um, and then started a business, and uh, one thing led to another. Um, and, uh, that business, one business closed and somebody suggested, why don't you do translation? And I've always liked foreign languages. So I've always been studying foreign languages just on my own, uh, Russian, Chinese, Arabic, anything with a different alphabet. Oh, wow. uh, and, uh, Japanese was in there. Um, and living in San Francisco, lots of Japanese people, tourists and what have you. So lots of people to talk to. And, um, and somebody suggested, uh, that I start translating. And so I did, uh, first as a, as a freelancer, um, and then later on as, a, as a, as a company. Yeah. That's so interesting. Cause, um, I imagine back in the nineties, it would have been, uh, much more, comp uh, much, much more people, uh, would need those kind of services and there wouldn't be enough people to actually provide them right because the translation now there's like you know huge companies a lot of people getting into translation but um back then i imagine it was a pretty rare skill uh yeah uh it, it's still a rare skill in, in fact um the problem is that in the translation business you're supposed to translate into your native language and that is the the bottleneck the talent mm -hmm. is uh limited in that regard because the number of uh, native English speakers who study Japanese um, is far fewer than the number of Japanese who study English. Right. right. So, so yeah. So, so that always worked in my favor, and it, it still works in our favor. Uh, yeah, I guess that's why we see so many uh, very odd translations when we when we walking around Tokyo. You see all these very strange translations, lots of misspellings on you know expensive signs that people have spent a lot of money to put up, and they've put a letter wrong or something. That's right. That's right. And part of the reason for that is, uh, and, and this is unique to the Japanese to English uh, translation market or between Japanese and English, is that the, the customer can't tell. They can't mm -hmm. judge quality. They're, they're so far removed from English, you know, as opposed to, let's say, a Spanish client who needs English to Spanish translation. That person can most likely read English as well as you do. So he knows what he's supposed to say, even though he may not be able to write it himself. So, mm -hmm. uh, but not so with the Japanese. So That's yeah, so you, get a, you get a lot of that bad translation. It's been, it's improved over the last 20, 30 years, but um, yeah, it's a problem. So for the people who might be interested in getting into translation in our audience, what's the reality like of working in the translation in, uh, industry? Because I think a lot of people imagine it being like very cool. Like you get to work with these very interesting companies and you, um, you're, uh, maybe doing a lot of work like on the computer and writing, but you're also getting to see a lot of interesting stuff behind the scenes. Like, what is it actually like? No, that's that's true. That is uh, that is one of the perks um, if you're into that kind of thing. You know, um, so um, when I first started off, I was just amazed that people were paying me to to basically study. Mm. Um, 
because when you're translating, when you're first starting out, particularly, you're just learning so much about the language that you didn't have to, you weren't responsible for it before. So you didn't have to know every last, you know, comma and, and uh, semicolon, you know, you had, you know, as long as you could communicate, you were fine. But uh, so when you start translating, it becomes important because this is, becomes your livelihood and it has to be correct. So you start reading more closely, even closer than the client reads it. And you will find the client's errors um, and start pointing it out. But you also get to study Japanese and you get to learn the inner workings of companies that, you know, you're studying conf or translating confidential information all the time. As this hasn't been released yet. So keep it to yourself. You know, those mm -hmm. kind of uh, translation jobs. And it, it really is. It's, a, it's an education in itself uh, on two sides, you know, the Japanese and the, the business part of it. Yeah. Um, what are some of the the sort of funny Japanese phrases that you uh, that you find often in in translating? Because I know one, for example, from my perspective, you know, working in in schools in Japan and working in uh, in marketing, that uh, trying to translate things like otsukari sama desu or yoroshiku negation, like, you you just can't translate them into English because we don't really have that feeling. So even if you could say like, oh, otsukari sama desu is kind of like thank you for working hard. It's like, we wouldn't even say that in English. So it sounds very strange. So what are some of the other sort of funny ones that uh, people who maybe don't speak Japanese that well wouldn't know? Um, uh, well, the, the famous, most famous one, I think is the, the Nado, the Nado uh, right. trap, uh, which is uh, translated variously as et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in, a, in a survey, uh, a uh, it's not a formal survey, but just a casual survey of other translators on that topic. Um, they all have their own way of dealing with it. Sometimes they pluralize it. You know, you say mm -hmm. uh, fruit um, or cars instead of, you know, uh, et cetera. You know, mm -hmm. because they, they, they often in Japanese, there'll be one example and then et cetera. You know, so they talk about the, the apple, et cetera. It's like, well, what's the et cetera? <laughs> <laughs> so, right. You know, don't know what that's supposed to mean in english um or in japanese it's just, it's just a um a habit they just put it in there because that's the way they speak and it just sounds more natural that way yeah mm -hmm. i mentioned this on the podcast before with uh with ruth but um i i when i was learning japanese one of the things i started doing was using a dictionary to try and help me instead of just yeah. putting it into my phone and google translating it because when you read the dictionary you get like a even a japanese to japanese dictionary you get a lot of context around that word that's really useful um as opposed to just translating it on your phone like oh that means that and it's like well it's probably not exactly the same yeah no no that's uh that, you know, the whole Google Translate thing is uh, anathema to a translator, professional translator. It's uh, poison. It's poison to, to a translator. That's interesting because Google and companies like that are doing a lot of work to try and uh, create language processing software that does a lot of the job of a translator. And people think that, that that's a good um, sort of proxy. But, um, you know, working in the translation industry, what are your thoughts on how those language processing um, softwares work? And are they actually a threat to translators' jobs? Um, no. Um, and uh, good thing you asked, but I think we need about another two hours to elaborate <laughs> on that idea. I mean, take I, your time. I want to I want to know like what that really means. OK, so uh, number one, um, the effort to uh, make a computer that can translate is as old as computing. Um, the whole AI concept started in like 1956. And the whole idea of the automaton has been around for uh, centuries. It goes back thousands of years. The automatic, you know, the golem um, is a, is a you know, perfect uh, German example. I guess that's German. Um, so, you know, the internet hits and the, and the thing that you need for an internet business is the uh, SLA uh, or the uh, user agreement, right? And there are, you know, thousands of, words or characters of text on a user agreement. It needs to be translated into how many languages? 26, 104. There's a lot of languages out there and Google's everywhere. So they all need, and Amazon's everywhere and uh, Rakuten is everywhere. So they need all this stuff translated into the language of, of the countries they're working in. So the volume of text that needs translation is, is exponentially growing, but the, uh, nobody wants to pay for it. So they are, they have a vested interest to create a, a machine that will do that for them, or at least cut down the cost of that. Um, it doesn't mean that it's quality stuff. What is, what the, 
it, it's uh, it reminds me of the um, the uh, the um, old uh, there's a uh, old newspapers talking about predictions for the future. Um, one of them was the uh, ability to understand animal speech, and like 1900 there was a prediction, and within 10 years we will create a system of understanding uh, animal speech. And then about every 10 or 15 years, they say, and in 10 years, we will be able to understand <laughs> animal speech. And it, goes, right. it goes on and on and on. And, and, uh, and Google Translate is, is just the latest iteration of that. Um, mm -hmm. So they're trying to do that. And they're, they're doing a lot better than they were originally when they launched in 2006. And, and for example, they've gotten the uh, use of the um, the the articles uh, correct in many instances uh, and the uh, which is hard. It's hard for a non-native speaker to, to get those straight. Um, to have a computer do it well is oh, that's impressive. But it's kind of like the walking dog, you know. It's like you can train a dog to walk on two legs, and that's amazing. It's like oh, that's you know great and cute and all that stuff, but it's still just a walking dog. Yeah. So Google Translate and the whole machine translation thing is is the walking dog, mm -hmm. um, and it's not it's it doesn't have um, it's not doesn't turn out professional quality translation, mm -hmm. which means somebody has to ride herd on it. So from my perspective, my my jaded perspective, I I look at it as kind of a scam. It's sort of like selling. So somebody buys a Ferrari and then you sell them the toolkit to fix their own Ferrari. Yeah. But they're not a trained mechanic, so what are they going to do with that tool set? Right. Not, nothing. They're going to they're going to make a mess of it. They're going to break it uh, because yeah. they don't know how to use the tools. And that's the same thing. So when you get to a, uh, to the machine translation, and they're selling a lot of systems now, Google Translate included, um, you need to hire somebody who knows how to run it. Basically, the translator. You need a professional translator to make sure mm -hmm. it doesn't screw you up. Yeah, well, it's so interesting because I've seen um, some of the tech demos and stuff that they release from somewhere like Google. Um, I remember, I think it was around 2018 or so, they had this tech demo of um, someone making a phone call for you. And so um, you just say, I want to book an appointment at uh, this hair salon at 10 o'clock. And then it would call and it would pretend to be like a real human and it would respond in real time to the person, you know, oh, are you like, uh, we don't have a 10, do you have 1030? And like, oh yeah, 1030 works fine. And it was like, whoa, this is really impressive, you know, that it's actually kind of processing and then replying in a way that's actually context sensitive. That's really impressive. But it's funny because that tech demo was, you know, three or four years ago, and we're still not seeing that in, you know, the new Google phones with the, the tensor chips and all that. They're still not actually doing it. And I wonder if a lot of these tech demos are just to kind of like build up some hype so that people are like, oh, wow, this is really cool. This is coming soon. But actually, okay. then they're just showing you the examples of the demo where it worked, you know, the two out of 900 phone calls where it didn't like freak out and, and scare the person on the other end of the phone. Right. And what you're talking about there is you're talking about the difference between specific AI and general AI. Mm -hmm. So specific AI, lots of them. There's lots of specific AI out there. The, auto, the, the autonomous car, that uh, autonomous driving is uh, um, an instance of specific AI. So there's AI working there to drive your car. Um, it's a very limited environment. Stay within the white lines. Don't hit the guy in front of you. Don't cross any red lights, you know, like that kind of thing. So the, the number of rules that, that has to that have to be uh, that the machine has to follow are limited. Um, so that's a specific AI. General AI is you and me. We're the mm -hmm. we're the pinnacle of general AI. You can take a human being, throw him into a spaceship, shoot him out into space, and he'll learn whatever he's got to learn to figure out how to live there. Mm -hmm. um, that's amazing. That is truly amazing. Um, so that's the difference. And what you're getting with AI is the specific AI. That's what they show you. The demo that works perfectly. Um, the real world is not limited to just ordering pizza. So, right. you know, voice recognition has come a long way. That's, that's convenient. That's beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things you can do um, that, are, that are beneficial. Um, making choices, not one of them. Uh, right. Anything that requires judgment. Um, and I'm not talking about measuring something. Oh, is it 12 feet long or 13? You know, I'm talking about judgment. Mm. Should I, you know, should I take a chance on the left road or take a chance on the right road? Because I don't really know where I'm going. And then you use other information like, oh, the fact that there are city lights over there. Well, that's probably a better place to go instead of into the complete darkness, right? I mean, those are mm. judgment calls that um, are very difficult to program. Uh, so I wonder to, if... Um it seems like then a lot of the tools that they're creating are things that maybe make a translator's job a little bit easier. So I'm, I, I'm sure 
you know, translators might take this, you know, one hour long audio clip and put it through some kind of uh, transcription software so that it'll recognize all the things that are being said. And then they'll go through manually and go, okay, well, that's definitely wrong. And that's definitely wrong. And, and actually pick apart the, the details. So it, it just reduces the amount of work they have to do writing down what someone said for an hour. And instead they that's can right. go through a transcript or something. That's right. And there's a name for that job. It's called PMTE, Post Machine Translation Editing. Okay. So it's more of like an editor job than it is a, uh, a translating job in a sense. Uh, yes and no, because you do have to understand the Japanese. And if your Japanese isn't up to it, then you're going to do a poor job. Hmm. So are translating jobs disappearing even, you know, even though those translations, like you said, it's like a walking dog. It's not perfect. It doesn't sound like, or it doesn't look like a human, but... Um, there are, like we said before, there are a lot of Japanese companies who are like, yeah, that's good enough to stick on a sign. And it's like, you see these signs everywhere that, that uh, have terrible English translations. So are there companies that are still kind of doing that, even though it's not a particularly effective way of translating? And is that impacting the number of translating jobs available? Yeah, uh, I, I, I may have given you the wrong impression because my generally uh, jaded view of uh, machine translation as a professional <laughs> translator, it has a place. Obviously, it has a place. People are paying money for that, um, so there is a there is a market for it, and there are people who, you know, close enough is good enough. You know, there are many cases like that. For instance, you know, user agreements. You know, it's like thousands of pages that change probably daily because the lawyers are always tinkering and going, ah, we don't want to get you know sued again for that, so we got to change mm -hmm. this wording, and that stuff goes on all the time. Uh, so that's not going to end. Um, and that's a, a useful thing for them to, uh, for machine translation to help them through, because a lot of it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And what you want to find is you want to find the, just the parts that are different now. Um, we already have a system. Trados is, is sort of like the de facto standard for computer-aided translation, which is not machine translation. It's a, a, a person looking at a uh, statistical database. It's all you know, mumbo jumbo. Basically, the, the computer is trained to look for sentences that are similar. So you've translated, I like apples once, and it's in your database. And then you got a sentence that says, I like oranges. And the, the computer says, hey, you translated something similar before. And here's the way you translated it. So it mm -hmm. just looks for things that are similar. And that's called um, uh, well, statistical uh, trans, uh, machine translation. And but So um, that kind of thing is just for consistency then. Like if, it, if there's like a certain kind of brand language that they should be using, then that helps you to make sure that you're not... Uh, translating in a different way each time. That's correct. And when there's when there things are so similar, you can use eighty percent of your original translation and just change a few words. So it mm. speeds things up for you. And you can get probably maximum a thirty percent bump from that. Okay. Um, and and another a practical problem of translators is that keeping your place in the document that you're translating. Um, that's hard uh, because you're looking back and forth between the document you're translating and the translation and uh, you lose your place. So you skip a paragraph and then you deliver that job and the client goes, hey, what happened to paragraph 42? And mm -hmm. you're like, uh, I don't know. What happened to paragraph 42? And you just got up to take a you know, pee break and then you came back and you started someplace else. You thought you were, you know, that happens. And the, um, the CAT tools, computer-aided translation tools, help prevent that. They keep mm. you in the right spot all the time. They'll also integrate glossaries. So you save time. You don't have to use uh, you know, look up stuff yourself. If it's in the glossary, the machine just says, hey, this is in the glossary. You want to use it? And then it's just a hotkey. You know, you just yeah. slide I'm it sure in. That's there. very useful for the very specific terms, especially in, in certain industries. There might be a word that has a very specific translation and it might be able to be translated five different ways. Uh, in context in the other in the target language um so yeah i've definitely seen that before where i've been using the wrong the wrong uh japanese kanji and so i look at it and for me i'm like okay that says this and then so, uh, somebody else re reads it and it doesn't make sense so a good example of this was um i tried to start a critical thinking school and i had a bunch of different translators working on this so that i could have the materials both in english and japanese and one of the translators who had this part translated critical thinking into hihan tekishiko which, I knew that was right and it doesn't it doesn't mean critical thinking in the way that we would mean in english um it in english it's oh, like, I you know, hate that red. it looks horrible 
Right. It's like, exactly. It's like thinking in a negative critical way um, oh. and being critical of people or something and, and being, it's almost like being rude. And so we had this like, and I, I was getting ready to print this out on our, on our papers. And uh, my girlfriend at the time saw it and she's like, whoa, that's really negative. That sounds really awful. You, you don't want to put that on your marketing materials, <laughs> like teaching people to think in a horrible negative way about others. And so I was like, whoa, like, thank God I had someone to actually see it before I sent it to the printer and ordered 2000 of them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good move. Um, Smart move there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's um it's sometimes a little difficult, but um so I wonder like for people uh who are looking for jobs in translation, um how do they kind of compete with um obviously like you said you want to be translating into your native language. So but there are so many Japanese people translating into English and a lot of companies just accepting that. Um how do foreign workers who want to get into translation and they're building up their Japanese skills, how do they get their foot in the door? Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying the conversation and I just want to take a quick moment to mention that this podcast is only possible because of the support of jobsinjapan.com. So next time you're looking for a job, check out jobsinjapan.com. There are tons of jobs on there, not only in English teaching, but also software engineering, hospitality, marketing and consulting, among many others. Most of the jobs on the board do not require any specific level of Japanese and you can get started in in minutes. So next time you're looking for a job, check out jobsinjapan.com and let's get back to the conversation. Um, okay, number one, don't worry about money. Whatever whatever the client wants to pay, accept it. Um, getting a job in-house is better than being freelance when you're starting off because you get to make all your mistakes on the client's dime. So that's the two biggest bits of uh, advice I could give you about that is uh, uh, but you know, you need experience. Maybe you know, and everybody has a different situation. So maybe working at a company is not for you. Maybe freelancing is not for you. Um, but um, if you're going to go, uh, if you're planning to do the long term, uh, getting into a company is um, a good way to go. And a lot of the more, a lot of successful translators that I know um, as freelance translators started off in house, and that in house connection help them a sharpen their skills, um, improve their skills. And then when they went freelance, that was their number one client because they have the insider information about that, that customer and that what goes on in that company. So they know what's being said, um, even in those you know, documents that are talking about, you know, corporate culture and things that nobody else would understand. Mm. Um, so they have that person has now an advantage with that client. They know you, they've worked with you, they know your quality. And they'll give you a whole, whatever work you were doing at the company, they will give it to you as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. um, although you may need to incorporate to, to maintain that relationship. Right. Um, and you mentioned um, that uh, you should take whatever rate you can get in the beginning so that you can just get the experience and get the, the uh, stuff on your resume. But um, what kind of rates do people um, that maybe entry level translation jobs what kind of rates would you expect and how is that really measured like is it by the word or for a project and then how much would you want to be earning in order to kind of make a living a full-time living as a translator yeah that's an impossible question to answer because there's just too many variables oh wow <laughs> um, and there everybody has a different need you know somebody might be independently wealthy you know it's like a trust fund baby you know it's like i just want to translate okay well it does the matter the money doesn't matter to you um, if you need to make money to uh, survive, uh, then freelance is probably not where you want to start because uh, it, it fluctuates uh, wildly until you build up a, a consistent clientele. Um, so it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, and to give you a point of reference, um, there are uh, translation jobs from agencies at five yen uh, for Japanese agencies working into English, right? Like I said, everything is too, too many factors involved, but uh, for going Japanese to English through an agency, you can get, you know, four to six yen a character. Um, okay. Some will pay higher if they know what they're doing. Um, some agencies understand uh, the need for a native speaker of the target language, and they know that it may cost more uh, because the native English speaking labor pool is smaller. Um, so you can expect a, a little bit of a bump there, get a little bit more money there. Um, but like I said, it, it depends, depends mm -hmm. on the individuals. Um, 
the uh, agencies will charge between 40 and 60% uh, on top of that. Um, and they get paid that because they have to babysit you. And when you get sick, they have to find somebody else to do it. And you know, they, <laughs> they have a lot more responsibility to deliver on time, no matter what, because they're a corporation. They're a team of people, they're not an individual. So, um, so you know, that's what I can safely say about rates. Right. So um, speaking of corporations, so you, you actually incorporated your company rather than working as a, a freelance translator, you created Honyaku Plus. So um, why did you create a company instead of continuing to work as a freelance or working in-house? Well, uh, so uh, there, are, there are a couple of reasons. One I mentioned earlier was that um, uh, to work for big corporations, you need to be incorporated because there are um, there's a different legal foundation for working with a, a private individual as opposed to working for a, co a company. Mm -hmm. um, companies are, you know, it's a you know, dog eat dog. You know, you take care of yourself. You're responsible for you. You fall down and hurt yourself. That's your problem. But if you're an individual, companies, in, particularly in Japan, they're very um, humane. Uh, the company has a big responsibility to take care of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, so to avoid that complication, uh, they only work with big companies normally only work with incorporated individuals. Fortunately, it takes very little to incorporate. Um, there's a little bit of paperwork involved. And then there's the, um, the annual tax reporting uh, exercise. Um, but for the most part, it's not that it's not that hard. Mm. So it's not hard to incorporate. That's uh, one reason. Sorry, uh, I was going to say, it sounds like you incorporated so that the companies don't have to treat you nicely. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, the other thing is that they, they will talk to you. They don't have to treat mm -hmm. you nicely, but they will talk to you. Mm -hmm. And um, the legal aspect is just something that the legal department worries about. All the, all the people at the company have no idea why they don't work with individuals until they ask and find out that, well, no, we don't work with individuals. We, we only hire companies. Um, but yeah, so the, the other, the, the, the positive side, uh, the reason to do that, the benefit is that they'll talk to you if you're a corporation. Mm -hmm. So you can get clients, uh, you know, name brands and whatnot, you know, Sony and what have you. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing was that the other reason why we incorporated, well, uh, I have a business partner, um, is that um, our competitive advantage is we're located in Tokyo and there's a lot of translators that come and they learn their chops and maybe they're here on an exchange program. Maybe they went to uni here. Maybe they um, joined the JET program or whatever and they're looking for that next thing. And so they get into translation because they're here and they can talk to people and they have some connection, but then they go home and they still have to maintain those relationships, which is really difficult to do. So um, we, on the other hand, we're here. I've been in Tokyo for almost 30 years now and we're not leaving. So our competitive advantage is what I call proximity to the source. I work right next to thousands of companies that use translation every day. So for us to find new clients is basically that's our primary job. And we also um, know all of the whole slew of translators having been in the business for so long and having been a translator myself. Um, we have a lot of co contacts. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, the, that whole industry has developed. So there's lots of, you know, there's pros.com, there's uh, gengo.com and all these uh, areas. Well, pros and gengo are different, but um, there's all sorts of networks that you can find translators. I assume there's a big difference between getting work as a translator and working as an interpreter. Um, is it much more difficult to be an interpreter or is it just a different kind of skill? It's two different worlds, mm. two completely different worlds. Um, yeah, interpreting, uh, interpreting is uh, black magic. So people who do it well, they're they're you know, they they have that X factor. Um, simultaneous interpreting is definitely black magic. Mm -hmm. um, you're, to, you're interpreting while somebody else is talking in your ear in a different language, and yeah. you're just spewing it out and it's like not for me i don't do that and mm -hmm. i know we uh, obviously we hire people that do that because we provide that service but um they're fabulous they're amazing um, um yeah so totally different fields and if you're going to go into it's easier to go into translation um unless you have that interpreter x factor mm -hmm. um 
it's easier to start in translation because right. you can take your time. Yeah, I remember and when I was um, I was working at a, a school and we had this uh, introduction meeting every year at the beginning of the the year, explaining what we you know what was changing, what was happening that year. And one of the teachers at the school, I think he was in his sixties, uh, I think he was retiring sh uh, shortly after I left the school. And um, he used to be a uh, an interpreter, I think, for some some um, big organization, like it might have been the UN or something like that. I don't know. And um, it was. It was incredible. I, it was the first time I'd experienced it firsthand where they were doing the meeting in Japanese and he was just sitting next to me and he was saying, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I can't, how can, how can you listen and just say it as it's happening? And he would, you know, they would finish and he would finish half a second after them. You know, uh, I, I was incredibly impressed with the ability to just kind of almost act like an in and out machine, just like, you know, English, uh, Japanese goes in and English comes out without any hiccup no step uh loss and he he didn't like struggle or or worry about it but i wonder if uh maybe he worked for the un for a, a few years and got really good at that skill then it was just something that he could do it was, it was incredible well there's actually interpreter training and mm -hmm. they are trained to hear the first couple of sounds and then predict what the whole sentence will be mm -hmm. and so that's how they do that they they get good at that wow. they hear the first they hear the first couple of utterances and they go, okay, now I, I see where he's going with that. And they start talking wow. and I'm sure, I'm sure they have to change, you know, tracks in the middle of, a lot, you know, it's like, Oh, cause in Japanese, the verb comes at the end. You don't know really what he's going to say until, mm. it, until that last word, you know, so then you might have to go, you know, at the very end go not, you know, or something. Yeah. I don't know what they do. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's so interesting. Um, you told me before we started the podcast that you um, you're also helping your wife with her English company. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, my wife speaks English uh, like a champ. Uh, she's she yeah she's uh, she's got a great ear, so her her English pronunciation is native. Um, and uh, she started a school because we have three kids, and uh, she has to be stuck with kids all day anyway. So. Let's uh, let's make some money at it. Mm. Um, that, that's overly simplified, but anyway. So she started that school, um, and it was just word of mouth because we have three ambassadors. You know, my kids all speak English uh, mm. because I've I've only spoken to them in English since they were born, essentially. Um, so so we get a lot of attention from that, and then we funnel that attention to to the school. Uh, wow. So that's how that worked out. Wow, and I guess you being there as well kind of being able to help out with a few of the things like uh um i guess in japan it seems like people really want to see a foreign person um even if it's you know it, and this can be sometimes a little bit discriminatory because you know there are people from countries like singapore or the philippines or something who speak english as their native language or or close to native um but you know people want to see like a, a guy from america or something like that that it kind of makes them feel reassured that it's an it's a real English school. Um, so I guess that you help out with a lot of that stuff. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, she has uh, other teachers. Um, so uh, yeah, and there is that factor. Um, the, the, the foreigner, uh, it's not really a token position. Um, there, the difference between Singaporean English and, and American English is, is uh, obvious to a native speaker. Uh, 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 anybody, actually, uh, anybody who speaks English will know that you know, Singaporean English is slightly different. Um, the pronunciation and whatnot. And the, the, there's a thing called prestige language. Mm -hmm. So uh, and prestige dialect. So we, even within America, um, the people who speak Midwestern English, uh, that accent is what you hear on TV. You don't hear southern accents or eastern accents or California is pretty much uh, very similar to the, to the Midwest uh, in terms of accent. But the, the, the prestige language is the language that's spoken on television. And mm -hmm. that's primarily Midwestern uh, accents. So um, so even within the United States, there's that bias. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to be if you want to be a great newscaster, you can't be talking like southerner. You got <laughs> you know, to sound like, you know, CNN. So, um, so there's that. So it, it's, and I know that's not, uh, it, I, I, I'm aware of the English uh, teaching community having a, having a sore spot about that. You know, yeah, there's a guy in Singapore and yeah, his English grammar is probably fabulous. Um, but that's not all there is to the story. So, yeah. you know, you've got to, you got to work with that. Um, there are, anyway, so that's, that's what that's about. And what I do there um, is uh, teach, but 
the Japanese, uh, this, I didn't know this before. I, when I first got to Japan, I did some English teaching, but being at the school is teaching kids is a whole different ball game. Yeah. And particularly monolingual kids teaching a, a Japanese native Japanese kid English requires a whole lot of skills that I don't have. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to maintain discipline for one uh, because they have some magic s- secret sauce that they use to maintain discipline. And for me, it's just it, it just falls apart. I, uh, mm-hmm. I can't. They just become wilder and wilder when I talk to them. But my wife can go in there and just like, you know, 30 seconds. Everybody's chill, sitting in their seats, paying attention. Like, okay. So there's that skill. skill. I can't do that. So um, so it's required, those that pair, you know. And the big the the onus of the work falls on the the native Japanese speaker because she can run the show or he can run the show. Um, the foreigner can't and provides the provides the authenticity. Right. It's interesting because I worked in um, in kindergartens for quite a while, and uh, I think I was maybe for around five years I was teaching as a kindergarten teacher and as a main teacher, not as a an assistant or something. And um, at first, it was an absolute disaster. It was an absolute disaster, like you said. It was crazy. The kids couldn't hear what I was saying because the way I was speaking to them, you know, I would speak like I would speak to a native English speaker. And so, you know, I, I, I can't even remember, like in the beginning, I think I said, I would say things like, come on, chop, chop or something like that. And it doesn't, you know, Br- very British, you know, hurry up. <laughs> right. Like, and right. even, even hurry up. Like they, you know, they, they might understand the kind of feeling of like, you know, that I'm saying it quickly and that means quickly, but they don't, they only get it after they've heard it 500 times you know and that takes a really long time so I came up with a lot of different like and and I guess these are like individual methods you know like every teacher is going to come up with whatever they go like oh that worked how do I and they do it again and again until it becomes kind of like a way of teaching and um I would get the kids to say something I would say like everyone and then they'd say yes and then they'd all shut up after they said yes and I'm like okay let's and that just doing that and I would say that's the little kids. And then, you know, I'd say, okay, when I do this, you do this and have this kind of like thing. But then that became kind of like a crutch that I lent on quite a lot. And I, I would uh, really struggle sometimes with students that didn't comply with it. And then I, you know, had a whole bunch of different frames for like trying to understand like kids do need to pay attention in order to understand what's going on. And it's really hard to get a class, especially when I started teaching in some kindergartens where I had 25 students, you know, uh, by myself and getting 25 kids to stop and pay attention when they're age five, that's really, really hard. So um, yeah, it's definitely a a skill on top of, you know, speaking the language, but um, yeah. But uh, no, I want to, I want to wrap up here. Um, so uh, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. So where can people find out if they're interested in your, uh, either your translation services or they want to find out more about what you do, where can they find you? Um, uh, well, we have a website. Um, it's uh, honyaku-plus.com, which uh, is spelled H-O-N-Y-A-K-U-P-L-U-S.com. And everything you need to know is, is right there. We have a blog and yeah learn a whole lot more about translation awesome thank you so much paul you're welcome